This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Earlier this week, I joined my friend John O'Donnell on his power trading radio show for investors. We had a great conversation about trade, tariffs, money, Karl Marx, and even why the labor theory of value seems to endure no matter how many times it has been refuted. So it's about 30 minutes. You'll enjoy it. Stay tuned. There's so much misinformation uh, out there, both in the media and even in academia, on the difference between what we'll call mainstream economics, uh, perhaps of the Keynesian kind or perhaps the Chicago school, versus the Austrian school of economics. Now, I believe we can agree, and you would know this better than anybody, being the grand poopa there at the uh, Mises Institute, that the Austrian school of economics is probably the fastest growing uh, school of economics in the world, uh, and that's primarily thank uh, to the work of the Mises Institute uh, for all these uh, years. But what I'd like to do today is to differentiate for our audience and just come and speak uh, and let's differentiate what is different about the Austrian tradition versus mainstream economics. And maybe let's just start with a couple of uh, either principles or our uh, unique characteristics uh, and, and, and see if we can't give our audience the cliff note version of what is uniquely different. Let's start with just the concept of money, you know, fiat money uh, versus real money. Uh, how would you uh, define that and differentiate that uh, under our cliff note version? John, the first thing about money is that historically uh, it, it rose in the marketplace and it was often aided and embedded by kings and monarchs, but the money had some sort of value the, the marketplace recognized. And throughout a lot of history, that meant gold or silver, but it didn't always mean those things. But when we say fiat, what we mean is that generally a government or a central bank can issue more of it uh, or issue it at all without having anything backing it. In other words, you don't, uh, you, you don't trade in your money for gold or silver the way you once could in Western countries, that the government just issues it as it sees fit to try to regulate that portion of the economy. So as a result of that, we have political money as opposed to marketplace money. And what I mean by political money is that uh, central bankers, like people at the Fed, good, smart people, are nonetheless influenced by the political and economic climate out there. And so they oftentimes have an incentive uh, to do things with money to make the economy feel better or at least seem better on paper. And, and what that also means is that when they choose to create more money, and that's in the United States anywhere, that's a bit of a roundabout process. They don't just print it up, as some people accuse the Fed, but they increase uh, both the monetary base, which is the, basically the money that banks have with the Fed, but also the broader money supply. When they do that, there's no new stuff out there. There's no more... Uh, no new goods or services created. So, so creating money in and of itself doesn't make us any richer. It just means we have more money to buy the same existing stock of goods and services that are out there. So what we ought to be concerned with in this country is productivity, uh, how productive our economy is, how much it produces um, using the, the, the capital that's available to it, not how much money there is. So an easy example is that if you gave everyone a million dollars, every U.S. citizen a million dollars tomorrow, uh, prices would adjust rather quickly, and the next day none of us would really be any better off. So manipulating the money supply, which is a hallmark of fiat money, what I would call political money, is something that uh, that politicians do to make themselves look better, but it's not something that makes us any wealthier or better off. You know, when I asked that same question of uh, Dr. Ron Paul, uh, he made a very bold statement in, in, from an Austrian perspective in philosophy, I believe, which is that honest money, uh, that is money backed with goods like gold or silver, has historically been the foundation of civilization because voluntary exchange, trade, uh, is an accelerant uh, to the growth of civilization. But yet the mainstream economists would tell us that, look, um, our civilization's been doing pretty good uh, with fiat money system going back to, say, 1913 with the Federal Reserve System. 
Uh, our economy's growing. We got more goods and services in our home today. Uh, I remember quite vividly as a uh, working as a paper boy and, and working in my father's pharmacy uh, in Hannibal, Missouri, uh, where our coinage was minted of, of silver. And um, uh, but I would make the case that I could buy a lot more units of gasoline today with one dollar uh, worth of silver coins minted pre nineteen sixty four than I can with one dollar of fiat money. And it's all about having a higher quality lifestyle through trade and having an honest uh, medium of exchange to facilitate that trade at a better ratio. What do you think? Well, it's true, and we are certainly better off than we were 100 years ago. Here's the catch is that, you know, ordinarily we would think of the economy as as one of exchange where both parties think they're better off, and that's great, and we are better off. If we didn't have money, we'd be forced to barter, and you'd be forced to go find somebody who uh, had something that you needed to trade with you in, in exchange maybe for one of your online courses. So that would be a difficult thing to do, and it would impose a lot of costs on society. It would make you worse off. It would make you poorer. So money arises as a, as a medium of exchange, and it makes societies richer. The problem is that one half of the equation, the money we use to purchase a good or service, is essentially manipulated politically. So its value can be changed radically. It's, it can be devalued very rapidly in a way that's awfully hard to do with, with what we would call sound money, gold or silver. So, you know, while we examine very closely sometimes the good or services that we're going to buy, my wife and I just had the misfortune of buying a new air conditioning unit for our house. So believe you me, we looked at long and hard at the options available before we decided uh, which one to buy. But the air conditioning company got our money, and since we're here in the United States and there are legal tender laws and, and currency laws, that's pretty much the only uh, form of payment they could accept. Uh, so they accepted that, but they don't have much of a say in the quality of those dollars, whether the, the Fed is, uh, and the Treasury are going to inflate in the near future, uh, whether those dollars are going to appreciate or depreciate in value, because that's all controlled politically, and that's outside the reach of your average air conditioning uh, repair company. So I would argue that they have to bake in to their cost and to their estimate they gave us some uncertainty with respect to that dollar and, and what it's going to be worth down the road. So it's a, it's a very strange uh, set of conditions where basically half of every transaction, i.e. the money being exchanged for the good or service on the other half, is, is subject to manipulation and control politically. Uh, in other words, we would all be aghast if the government sat around and decided how many bushels of wheat would be provided this year, would be produced this year in America, and who should produce them, and how much a, a farm worker who, who uh, produces wheat should be paid, and where the wheat should be distributed, and what towns should get how much. We would all say, well, that sounds very communist. That sounds like central planning, but that's sort of what we do. With the dollar, we have a, a, a board of governors at the Fed, and we have an open market committee that sits around and, and, and talks about how much money there ought to be and what the interest rates uh, at which people borrow it ought to be. So it's, it's uh, not capitalism in the sense of private property as I know it. Well, while we're on the topic of money, of course, the Austrian School of Economics, uh, other than mainstream economics, has always been a champion for entrepreneurship, and we've seen over the last seven years the entrepreneurial rise of the cryptocurrency space. Um, I don't know that the Austrian School of Economics has published um, a position paper on this, but, uh, well, I'll just ask you, what is the Austrian perspective, if there is one, uh, the official line from the Austrian School of Ec Economics? Because the mainstream economists are having a real problem with it, it seems like, uh, but yet it is emerging. Um, it's had some road bumps, but it shows great prospect with the new blockchain technology. But what is the Austrian official position on the emergence of cryptocurrencies? Well, there is no Austrian official position. I'll just say unofficially that uh, I think people are excited and happy to see some sort of competition to political currencies arise. There's a lot of rigorous debate over whether it has, whether cryptocurrencies, not blockchain technology, but cryptocurrencies right. themselves have any existing value independent of their exchange value. And if they do not, whether that matters 
this all harkens back to a, a concept that Ludwig von Mises had called the regression theorem that says money ought to, or money arises because there's some sort of pre existing value as a commodity. And not everyone accepts that. I certainly do. But there's a lot of debate even within within Austrian circles and, and within within broader circles about whether cryptocurrency is real money. But um, if you read Hayek, he, uh, Friedrich von Hayek absolutely believed in uh, cr- creating competition in money and competition in currency and, and the idea that people have some things, some, some mo- uh, m- methods to purchase things other than with dollars or euro or Swiss francs, whatever it is, I think is a, is a, is a benevolent development. So I'm, I'm very interested in cryptos. I read a lot about them. I follow uh, uh, various currencies, but, but more importantly to me, uh, the blockchain chain technology behind it uh, has a lot of promise for eliminating middlemen and intermediaries in our in our world because so many of our transactions uh, have extra expenses baked in because of the lack of trust. Like for instance, if you sell your house and someone else buys it, well, you have to have uh, some some title insurance and you have to someone has to search and make sure that you John own that house free and clear without any mortgages. And someone has to check and see whether there are liens on that property or whether there are certain zoning restrictions or, or maybe easements from Orange County or whatever it might be. And then um, someone has to check and make sure the furnace and the roof are okay and all that sort of thing. So there's, if, if you're, dealing, you're selling your house to a stranger, there's a lot of issues surrounding trust. So that's why we have a pretty expensive title insurance and, and uh, escrow process. And, and the blockchain... This is just one example. The blockchain has some promise to eliminate much of that, to create um, a, a trail, a, a ledger of transactions that would would uh, make make uh, these purchases frictionless and, and less costly with lawyers and that sort of thing. So it's it, it's a fascinating time. I you know I, we can't say what the future will bring, but here but there's a reason why we can't say what the future will bring. And that's because money really ought to be up to the market. The marketplace ought to decide what is good money and what is bad. And by the marketplace, we mean 7 billion people on Earth getting up every day and doing what they do. So when someone says, well, John, crypto is going to be worthless, it's going to go to zero, it's all a big scam. And when someone else says, oh, John, you know, get buy as much Bitcoin as you can now because one Bitcoin is going to be worth a million dollars in 10 years. Well, that's those are interesting uh, things to think about, but... You or I don't decide that. The marketplace does. The market decides what's what's money. Even and, and in this instance, um, the market is doing that outside of government, which is what's so fascinating. Well, let's get to the next topic, Jeff, which is trade. I am so disgusted. I can't believe even the Keynesian mainstream economists get out of bed every morning and say, you know, what we need for global growth is a trade war. I want to talk about. Let's go back to Adam Smith, although I guess we can't call him an Austrian. But the Austrian School of Economics has done an incredible job of articulating the concept of comparative advantage. Uh, Where is all this consternation in Washington, D.C. coming from on planned trade, uh, not free trade, but nothing that resembles um, a freer, flatter, fairer playing field uh, for trade? Why can't they embrace simply, in the wisdom of Adam Smith, comparative advantage? Yeah, it's interesting because what's different about us is exactly what makes us wealthy. In other words, uh, you and I benefit because somebody else had a capacity for and a propensity to attend med school. And maybe he or she becomes a good surgeon, and maybe at some point in our lives we need a shoulder or knee surgery. So we're awfully glad they did that. And maybe uh, that doctor... Uh, and wants some online trading advice and, and comes to a PTR academy. So there, that, you know, the fact that we have different skills and interests and abilities and inclinations is a good thing and allows us to, to swap goods and services with one another. And when you go beyond national borders and take that into, into the broader world, it becomes even better. If, if somebody can make a, a T-shirt that's halfway decent in China that's good enough for us and we go buy it at the Gap on sale for six bucks, um, that's a good thing that it's not $12. And it's also a good thing that it doesn't have a $2 tariff on it, which isn't really doing anything uh, to, to help or hurt the Chinese, per se, but it's giving us, it's giving more power to Uncle Sam and our own government. It's just a tax on us. So, that, so many of the same people, uh, let's say, um, 
on the protectionist right, sort of the Pat Buchanan, and I love Pat Buchanan, but sort of the Pat Buchanan line of thinking on the protectionist right, and maybe the uh, labor union line of thinking on the protectionist left. Uh, a lot of people would would complain mightily if you if you raise the income tax on everybody five percent, but if you slap some tariffs on something, they're delighted. But but at the end of the day, it's the same thing. It's a tax paid by Americans. On goods coming into the country, and we're and that money goes to the U.S. government. It makes the U.S. government bigger and badder and and bolder, uh, as, as opposed to staying in our own wallets where we use it uh, as we see fit. So I I'm I, I'm a true uh, free trader in the sense that I believe in unilateral uh, unilaterally dropping tariffs. I don't care what other countries are doing to U.S. imports if they want to sell us cheap stuff and take our dollars for it, and we all feel we benefit because we buy it voluntarily, then that's great. And if they're, if they're slapping 10% import tariffs on Ford cars or vehicles, I, I don't necessarily like that, and I don't like the fact that they're hurting their own citizens. But nonetheless, that in and of itself is, is no argument from my perspective to slap a same a 10% tariff on that imported T-shirt at the gap. So a lot of people, now let, let me be fair here, a lot of people strenuously disagree with unilateral trade tariff reductions. They say, no, 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 Jeff, we have to have a level playing field. And, you know, what about our manufacturing industries? What about our, our exports and this and that? In other words, there's a fetish for exports over imports, which is kind of nativist and nationalistic. And I get that. I mean, I, I you know, when I was a kid, my dad worked for Fire So Tired Rubber Company, which was directly tied to the health of the U.S. automobile industry. Um, so I, I get that. But at the end of the day, we, we have to remember that the economy is not just exports. It's, it's imports, too. It's what we want to buy. And no matter what your perspective, I don't think sending more money to the federal government here in America levels anything or, or hurts the Chinese. Uh, so... Um, I, I'm I'm a doctrinaire. I'm I'm one of those guys that a lot of people on both the right and the left don't like, which is a doctrinaire free trader. I got it. I'm with you. We had uh, Dr. Richard Ebling on yesterday on Power Trading Radio for our listeners. If you didn't catch that show, you might want to go back to the Power Trading Radio archive. We we spent the whole show just talking about international trade and tariffs and comparative advantage, and and really did a deep dive into that subject matter. And I think you'll really enjoy it. Let's talk about something, that, of course, that is very important, uh, which is the division of labor. The, uh, the concept of the division of labor, as a young businessman, I really struggled with. I remember uh, when I started my first businesses, I was very nervous about new employees. As I worked into the marketplace and for other companies, larger, as they would bring in new employees, I struggled with the whole concept, personally, uh, with the division of labor, but yet... By studying Austrian economics, I got very, very comfortable very quickly with the power of the division of labor and why it's so critically important to the development of civilization. And uh, so give me your cliff note version on why we need more division of labor. And, and that gets, of course, into the pri concept of price and price controls, wage, con wage controls, uh, which is a real evil. Uh, seems to be championed by mainstream economics everywhere, but the Austrians have a very specific uh, la laissez-faire attitude also about wages. So let's talk a little bit about the power of the division of labor and why it's so critical and central uh, to the Austrian perspective. Well, we have to look honestly at what humans do, how they act, and it turns out that human beings are not fungible. We all have different abilities. We all have different intelligence. We all have different skills. Um, and then we all go do different things with regard to our jobs, our education, whatever it might be. And rather than lamenting that and trying to force everybody into the same pigeonhole, we ought to celebrate that. And, and one way we celebrate that is, is through wages. We discover what people can do and what it's worth in the sense that, uh, we, you know, the person who works for an employer um, provides at least somewhat more value than their than their paycheck. So, the the division of labor is so important because it allows people to do uh, to specialize and do what they're best at and do what they're comfortable with and, and what they prefer. Not in all circumstances, not perfect, but but in most circumstances. So, it, it's precisely our differences that make trade possible. Because if we were all the same, if all countries around the world, if all people around the world had the exact same abilities, we might as well all sew our own shirts or you know, 
cobble together our own cars, but, but we're not all the same, and we have different strengths and weaknesses. So, so that's reflected in the division of labor, not only here in the U.S., but, but around the world. And that's a good thing, because if we were all the same, there'd be no need to trade. And without trade, we wouldn't be you know, making trade-offs that we think make us better off. Uh, so the, the division of labor is very, very important. And, and he, where the Austrian school really differs is, is where the entrepreneur enters the picture. Uh, other schools of thought, sort of the mainstream neoclassical school, the Keynesians, uh, other schools of thought don't really have much of a, of a theory developed about who the entrepreneur is. In other words, the per- person who makes calculations and takes risks and invests capital that he or she could lose. That's very different than someone who, who has a job for, for a wage. Now, that job can go away. I'm not saying it's, it's so easy being an employee, but it's, that's different than risking your own money to build something. So the, the, the entrepreneur has a very unique role in, in that division of labor. And the, the best thing we can do, in my view, for both the entrepreneur and for the, the, the people that he or she might employ is, is to let them pay what they want. Um, I think minimum wage laws hurt the poor far more than they help, and I think that we we can look at, at that axiomatically and say, you know, all things being equal, when you raise the price of something, and what we're talking about here is we're raising the price of, of unskilled labor, let's say, um, in, in Seattle where you have a $15 minimum wage, I believe, you say, well, you know, when you raise the price of something, you get less demand for it. And as a matter of fact... Uh, any jobs or would-be jobs that, it, that people consider worth less than 15 hours an hour either go undone or they, they occur in some sort of black market. So it's, it's, um, it's not always intuitive, and I understand the arguments for minimum wage, and I understand um, you know, the arguments that everyone should go to college and these kinds of things, but it, it, it turns out humans are, are stubbornly different, and, and why, do we, why do we resist that rather than celebrate that is my question. It's a very good point, and uh, for some reason, the mainstream just cannot embrace that. And unfortunately, I think there's a lot of smart mainstream economists, but they seem to get tied up in the politics of all of this and buying votes with some of this uh, jargon. But but you'd like to think uh, that down deep, they understand this debate rather, rather clearly. That gets down to our friend uh, Karl Marx, or excuse me, Karl Marx. I didn't say, I misspoke there for a moment. Uh, Marx talks about the subjective uh, 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 theory of labor, uh, that, l- that labor is the subjective um, maker, or that labor inputs into the production of a good determines value, versus the Austrians with Karl Menger and Mises go into great detail, and it was very helpful for me in my business career to recognize, no, no, that's not it it at all. And it seems to be that is Marx's primary driver um, and bone of contention with capitalism, among several others. But yet, subjective value is that value is in the mind of both the producer and the consumer uh, to meet a particular need, and that all value is, in fact, subjective, and it really has nothing to do with how many units of labor go into the production of a particular good. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, absolutely. This was not only Karl Marx's great error, but it was also an error of, the, of Adam Smith and yeah. the classical school. And they had the notion that, that value, the labor theory of value, that value comes from how much you spent to produce something and how many man hours went into it. But, but here we could look at a diamond that, that uh, came up from the ground on its own, and that someone finds an and it, and it identical diamond that was mined at great expense and at great man hours and, and take the two diamonds together and say, well, De Beers would pay you the same for both. And uh, the, 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 other, the other obvious uh, conundrum or problem with the labor theory of value is that there's lots of things that are difficult, but people won't necessarily pay you to do them. And, and this, is, this is, uh, is behind the idea of make-work jobs of the government. We could take inmates, for instance, in prison, and we can make them uh, move a pile of rocks with shovels from point A to point B, and then the next day we could tell them to move them back. And that, that would be a, uh, an arduous, physical, sweaty task for those prisoners, but there'd be no value to society. No one would care or pay you to do that. So, 
you know, one one great thing that the that, that Austrians understood was that value is subjective and and it exists on the margins. In other words, we care, we might care an awful lot about having, or some people might care an awful lot about having a fancy car, for example. And when they they finally reach a point in life where they can go buy that. Um, Ferrari or whatever it might be, that they really they really enjoy it and they feel very happy and they they'd much rather have that Ferrari than the hundred and fifty thousand dollars or whatever that they have to pay on it. But and and so to them that that was a good trade off. But if if you start to collect Ferraris and you have three or five of them, that that fourth or fifth one's worth a lot less to you than the very first one was. And that means that 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 shows what we call diminishing marginal utility. You don't care as much about the fifth one doesn't make you quite as excited and happy and glowing as that very first one did. Uh, and this applies in in big and small ways uh, across the whole economy. You need enough food and shelter and and basic necessities to get by, and then beyond that, you start moving on to other things that satisfy different needs and wants. They're sort of higher up on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with that. Um, but we we value certain things more. And if we were starving or or very very thirsty. Um, we we would value food and water far more than we would value a Ferrari. Um, we might we might if we were in dire enough straits, we might trade our Ferrari for a meal or for a jug of water. Uh, so how can how can a Ferrari, a hundred and fifty thousand dollar Ferrari, uh, be worth only a jug of water in exchange? Well, that shows you that value is subjective. It depends on the on the people buying and selling, and it depends on the circumstances. So. Um, this this damnably human uh, uh, instinct, this human condition of all of us valuing different things uh, differently, is, is is enduring, and we can't do away with it any more than we can do away with human nature. You could give me a billion dollars tomorrow, and I wouldn't buy a Ferrari. I, I just would have no interest in a fancy car. I would worry about scratching it or something, and I would feel silly driving it like everyone was looking at me. And there are some people who don't even have $150,000 to their name, who nonetheless go out and borrow money to buy a Ferrari because they they want it so bad and they're so concerned with having that Ferrari. So that person is very different from me in, in their, you know, in what they like in a car. And this is, this is just a fundamental point that economics didn't get in really until the 1800s, until relatively recently, late 1800s. So it's a fascinating thing to think about, and it it it, it informs everything in economics. And unfortunately for Marx, getting that wrong, we have Marxian economics. We say Marxian, but then we have Marxist politi- politics. So because Marx got that wrong, and he felt that capital exploits labor, that everything the capitalist makes off of selling something is just is just uh, money that ought to go to labor who created it and, and provided all the value. But from that from that faulty understanding of value, a lot of terrible things flowed, and it, in, including you know that the subject, the labor theory of value is one of the core. Uh, fundamentals behind Marxist and political philosophy, which, you know, I don't have to tell you what, what that caused in the 20th century. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.